Uh, good morning, Maytown. Good to be back with you again. God is so good. God is so good. Hey, I want to thank uh, Pastor Paula and Pastor LaDonna for uh, stepping in, jumping in for me. Again, this is a pre-recorded message that will be played uh, Sunday, but we are having church outdoors here at 1030 uh, every Sunday, given the weather. And we've had about a five-week stretch now. It's been awesome. And we'll do that again next Sunday. I was able to have a little time off. And even though I was here outdoors to uh, be a part of the worship, uh, Pastor Paula preached, I think, on the 5th, and then, uh, or uh, LaDonna, and then Paula preached the following Sunday. And it was a great break for me to be able to just worship and, uh, and receive under their ministry. We did have a, Paula preached an amazing message on the Spirit of God. And um, last Sunday, but the audio didn't come through on the video for the upload. So we don't know why. It's just one of those things. I promise you we're on it. We're going to do the best we can. And I, I just extend the grace. Today's a new day. So we're going to make sure that this is going to happen today. Amen. All right. Get your Bibles out. No PowerPoint today. I want you to get your Bibles out. Go to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to go back to this narrative here in, in 2, 1 through 5. That's where, I, uh, that's where I was two weeks ago when I preached, three weeks ago uh, uh, today, Sunday. And um, there's something here that in my time of just devotion and just working through this, the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit was showing me some things that just touched my heart. And I, I pray it will touch your heart too. And I'm just compelled when I when I get that revelation or when I get that sense that even though it's been preached, it's not all it's it's never done. It's never always said. Uh, I go back, and so that's what I want to do today. So let's go Mark chapter two. I'm going to start at verse one. Follow along in your Bibles, and uh, let's see what the Lord has. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you'll so bless the reading of the word, the preaching of the word. And, and Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for the revelation that you pour out, the illumination to our minds that was promised by Jesus so that we can receive, that we can glean, we can grow, and we can be more like Jesus on earth, that we can be that city on a hill, that, that, that lamp on a mountaintop, that light, that living epistle to the world around us. And Father, I just pray that we'll never be the same even after today that will go to a new spiritual address as you uh, put this into our hearts. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, when he had come back to Capernaum, this is Jesus, several days afterward it was heard that he was at home. Again, we talked about this. It was likely uh, Simon Peter's house up at Capernaum. Verse 2, And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Jesus was preaching to them. The people gathered. We know from history that a typical house is about 18, uh, you know, 18 feet by 18 feet, pretty small dwelling. So who knows, 50 people, you know, inside, outside, crammed around, we don't know. But there was a group there. Verse 3, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, we don't know who the, cup, the cripple was. And we don't know who these four guys were that came. And uh, we talked about that a little bit uh, three weeks ago. Matthew and Luke tell us he was carried on his pallet. In other words, when you look at the other Gospels to fill in all the blanks, Matthew and Luke tell us that these four guys carried this guy on his pallet or his bed in which he lay daily uh, at home, possibly even on the road begging. Verse 4. Being unable to get to him, in other words, the four guys being, it, being unable to get this crippled in front of Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Luke 5 again tells us the four guys, they, they go there, he's on his bed, uh, they can't get in because of the crowd, so they go up a set of steps that went up to the roof, they go on the roof, they dig through it, whatever type of roofing it was, uh, uh, probably a, you know brick walls with some kind of wood beams with some indigenous uh, material on there and some clay, whatever it was. They dug through it and they let the paralytic down at the feet of Jesus. I, I love to stop and think about uh, 
when I'm reading in my Bible and, and you get a narrative like this, I like to just stop and close my eyes and really wonder, what was it like that day? What would it have been like to be in that room? I can imagine when the dust and the dirt starts falling and all of a sudden the sun beams start shining through the roof and then all of a sudden you see the guys in the commotion. I imagine everybody was looking up, I would assume that, including Jesus. And here comes this guy down right in front of Jesus. Verse 5 is a key. Verse 5 says this, and this was kind of our key text three weeks ago. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I touched on this a little bit. Let me go back. Their faith, that's plural. In other words, Jesus looking around, he sees maybe the faith of the four guys through the roof or, or maybe the faith of the paralytic alone or, or and the four guys or everyone in the room, but everyone was at awe. Remember, they were gathered around Jesus because they heard that he was healing the sick and that he was a miracle worker. Not all of them put it all together that he was the promised Messiah yet, but they were gathered there, and assuming this all happened, they were probably all just at all wondering, is he going to heal this man? Because that was the man's perceived need. His biggest perceived need was as a cripple, he needed to be healed. You've probably heard the term heaven invade earth. I think uh, Pastor uh, Bill Johnson down at Bethel's kind of coined that term, heaven invading earth, by his book. Well, right here you have earth invading the kingdom of God by faith. Because here these guys dig a hole, they bring this, whether he was a friend or they just had sympathy, maybe he was a relative, a brother, we don't know, a father, we don't know. But here we have earth invading heaven, invading the kingdom of heaven by faith. Either way, Jesus says to the cripple then, focus just on the cripple, singular, son, your sins are for given. Again, in my last message, I, I, I said this, I just can't help but wonder what the first thoughts of the four guys were, were that carried the guy there when, when he heard the word, son, your sins are forgiven. Because obviously, it seems obvious within the narrative and everything else, that the reason they brought him there was for healing. And to them, to me as a guy, logical guy, be pretty obvious, we did all this work this guy's laying on this mat. He needs to be healed. And they're perceiving that his greatest need is just healing. It's all he needs. The guy's sick. He's a cripple. And uh, he needs a, needs a healing so he can participate, get up, run, and participate in life. On the surface, all of the efforts of these guys then was that the guy needed to be healed. And then when Jesus said, sons, your sins are forgiven, I just, I wonder what that, what that did to them and how long that period was. Jesus liked to deliver and let people think a little bit. So he probably said, son, your sins are forgiven. And probably, uh, and I don't know this, but according to Pastor George, probably just sat there, sat there for a minute, smiled, and then looked around and let everybody kind of bake in their own juices for a minute. All right. Now, um, even though they thought healing was the answer, Jesus knew what the real depth, the greatest need of this guy was. And that was the forgiveness of sins. I said this also three weeks ago. Look, what good would whole legs do if you ran all the way to hell with them? Think about it. In other words, regardless of his present condition and regardless of his past suffering and or his future hopes, the healing of his body at best would only be temporary while the forgiveness of his sins, remember that, they're, they're eternal. And Jesus knew that. And that's why when they brought Jesus to him, Jesus started at the depths of the problem, the depths of his need, and then worked his way back from that and then secondarily healed his body. Now, I think one reason uh, that I came back to this message again this Sunday is because it just needs to be said again. As we come to the Lord in prayer, I'm in a new season of my life. I was just able to retire from my outside job. I worked a secular job. I've been here at Maytown 10 and a half years at this church. And I've worked a secular job uh, full-time at first and part-time for the last couple of years. 
to supplement the income to help bless the church and to work through the process here at Maytown. I just uh, yesterday or Thursday of this week was able to retire, step down from that job and come to the, this church full time. First time in 10 and a half years. I'll be here. My office is set up and it was a joy. And I thought, man, Lord, if I could just lay down that secular job and get to the church full time, that's just all I need. And this really challenged me because even though that was at the the foremost of my thoughts, finally finishing the last day of work in the secular job and able to come to the church full time, my greatest need is still the forgiveness of my sins. Isn't it interesting how things, the main thing, whatever your main thing is, come on, whatever whatever's bothering you, if it's a healing or an opposition or like me with the job, transitional thing, whatever the main thing is on your heart, that's kind of what you pray for. And you can even kind of lose track of other things. But even in that, I just, in reading this, this narrative, I thought, man, Lord, you know what? I'm so thankful that you provided for me and my family. And I've been so blessed to be able to now transition here full time. But the greatest need, my greatest need is not to be at the church full time as a pastor. My greatest need is to have my sins forgiven and to know it. Somebody say amen. Come on. In other words, think of it this way. Of all the things we petition God in prayer, the deepest, the greatest thing we should desire and and should always know and understand and keep close to our heart is this. Our sinful nature needs forgiveness and eternal salvation that comes with the forgiveness of sins. And then also to know in the depths of our hearts, here's what I know. I know that I know that when I take my last breath on earth, I'll be in the presence of God. I'll be absent from this body and present with God. Why? Because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God through salvation that's in me. Isn't it great? All right, now, there's another reason here that really kind of rocked my world this week in just thinking through this process. And I want to share that with you. So let's go back to the text. Let me just kind of finish the text out and then let me share with you what else I believe the Holy Spirit has shown me. Here we go. Mark chapter 2, verse 6. Follow along in your Bibles. Jesus heals the man. He says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now look at verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Now, Now, reasoning in their hearts is a phrase that's telling you they're not saying it verbally, but they're thinking it. So some of the scribes are sitting there, and when Jesus said, Sons, your sins are forgiven, they start thinking these things inside of them. And their thought was, verse 7, Why does this man speak that way? In other words, Jesus, why why do you say that? Why do you how can you do that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That little statement right there, even though that is the basics of Christianity, that one rocked me this year, this this last week. That one stacked me up and made me stop and think through a process, and I want to share more about that. Verse 8, immediately answered in his spirit, or Jesus, uh, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Now, watch this. Right here between the lines, there's a message within a message. There's the clear contextual uh, oversight or, or interpretation of what's going on. They're thinking inside. Jesus discerns what they're thinking. He says, why are you thinking that? Right? But right here between the lines, this is what I see. Right here early in his ministry... Jesus, as God, through his omniscience, is discerning their thoughts. In other words, he discerns their thoughts as God through his omniscience, (laughs) and they're accusing him of not being God by saying, Son, your sins are forgiven. Pretty interesting. I don't know if they caught that. I did. They might not have caught that. But him just saying to him, why are you thinking these things? That should have stacked them up right there. I don't know that it did. So Jesus, through his omniscience, understands that they don't believe him to be the promised Messiah. And by knowing this, he poses the question to them. In other words, why are you reasoning this way? Jesus is kind of putting a rhetorical question back on them, right? It was almost like a pun saying, guys, 
You don't believe in me. You don't even know who I am. Why are you thinking these things? And then he goes to verse 9 and he poses this question and he says this. Guys, which is easier to say to this paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Let me finish the narrative. But so that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up immediately, he picked up his pallet, and he went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed, glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Pretty amazing. What is easier to say to the paralytic? In other words, Mark is telling us that the hearts of those around him, specifically the religious leaders, are still hard and unbelieving. Their heart is hard and unbelieving. Because when he forgives the crippled sins or when he proclaims it, they're shocked and angry and instantly accuse Jesus of blaspheming or showing contempt or irreverence towards God. Why? Because he is claiming to do something only God can do. Now watch this. Again, everything seems like, yeah, duh, I know that on the surface. So they think to themselves, again, verse 7, who can forgive sins but God alone? That is the question that really needs to be answered. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Some years ago, I was preaching on, I don't even remember the series, I just remember the illustration, on about God and why God had to come to earth totally identify with humanity. I believe we're in the book of Hebrews. He became just like us in every way, right? He was tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. He totally identified with humanity. I kind of touched on that again in the 23 Me series that we preached at Christmas time. But I, but I had this illustration of why Jesus had to become man to uh, face the cross, obviously, but to forgive our sins. And I, and I came up with this illustration. The Holy Spirit quickened it to me again, so let me give it to you again. So here was my illustration. This was some years ago. Let's suppose on a Sunday morning after church service that I uh, jump in my Jeep. I drive a little Jeep. I jump in old Seymour the Jeep, and I just back up. It was a great day. Oh, my gosh. And I just back right up, and I run right into Ben's car. Ben's car sitting there all pretty and fancy, and it's got a nice plastic grill and chrome bumper and old Seymour's got a big old tire carrier and a steel bumper and I just damage the front of his car. I pull ahead, I get out and I go back. Nothing wrong with Seymour the Jeep. I mean it's all steel and a little few scratches but Ben's car, the grill smashed, the bumper's bent down and a lot of damage. So I like think to myself, oh my gosh. So I go into Ben, Ben's a good Christian guy, I go in there and say, hey Ben, hey look, I just ran into your car. I am so sorry. And Ben's such a nice guy. He says, well, let's go look. We go out and we look together. And Ben says, no problem. I forgive you. It was an accident. I forgive you. Just give me the name of your insurance company and I'll get it fixed. No worries. Now, the question I pose, not not using Ben as an example, but anyone would likely say that. The question I posed was this. Is that true forgiveness? And the answer is no, it's not. Why? It's not true forgiveness because Ben isn't paying the price to fix my car. The insurance company is. In other words, the offense was against Ben, not against my insurance company. And if Ben's going to forgive me, if Ben's going to totally forgive me, he needs to forgive me totally and fix his own car. Otherwise, he's deferring part of the forgiveness to someone else, to the insurance company. I hope you can get a hold of this. Oh, Jesus, get a hold of this. My point being this. The only way you can totally forgive me is to fix your car yourself because the offense is against you, not my insurance company. Otherwise, you're not forgiving me. You're simply deferring the cost of your forgiveness or words through someone else to make it right. Now, in essence, 
this might be a stretch for you, but I get this. I got a simple mind. <laughs> in essence, this is what the scribes were saying in verse 7. Wow, how can he speak like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's what I see. Who are you to forgive him when you're just a religious insurance company running around making empty claims that cannot be proved? That would be another uh, way of saying it in English, what the scribes were thinking. So here's what I see. When Jesus looks at the paralyzed man and says, your sins are forgiven, son, your sins are forgiven, here's what he's saying, and this is what clearly came to me through just the unspoken voice of the Holy Spirit. Your sins are really against me. Now, I know that. But in this world, I sinned against Ben when I backed into his car in my illustration. Or I sinned against my wife when I yelled at her. Or I sinned against this person. Or I sinned against that. But in reality, what Jesus is saying right here, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the scribe saying, No one can do that except God Himself. This is what the Holy Spirit just lays into my heart. What Jesus is saying without saying it, in other words, between the lines or the implication from silence is this. Your sins are really against me, son. Your sins are against me. Why? Because I am the Son of God, the Lord of the universe, and because I am the only one you've backed into in the parking lot of life. And I'm the only one who can totally forgive you and fix your car. <laughs> so Jesus, again, says to them in response, go back to verse 9, look in your Bibles at verse 9. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk? Now, on the surface, the interpretation is easy. You go to 9 out of 10 commentaries, and they're going to say, well, uh, it's obvious what he meant. Uh, it was easy to say your sins are forgiven because it can't be tested. There's nothing to see in reality. In other words, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or tell this guy to stand up and walk, and him either walk or not. What's easier? Well, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven because you can't judge it. There's no test, right? There's no way to verify that. But Jesus right here to prove the unseen, the forgiveness of his sins, proves his authority to do that by then saying, Pick up your pallet, son, and walk. In other words, he verifies the unseen with the seen, with something tangible. Son, get up. Now, if the guy didn't get up, then guess what? They would have thrown both out. But the implication from silence is, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or stand up? But I'll tell you what, stand up, son. That guy stood up and he ran out of that building. What's on the table? Both things are true. Your sins are forgiven. Stand up and walk. In other words, Jesus knows what the religious leaders are thinking here. But right here, I just get this, right here in Mark chapter 2, right at the get-go of this gospel, I'll tell you what I see happening. The shadow of the cross is falling upon Jesus' path. And this is what the Holy Spirit was showing me in all of this right here. By forgiving the man's sins... And by healing his crippled body, Jesus is taking a decisive, irreversible step as the Son of Man. Remember now, he was the Son of God, he was the Son of Man, fully God, fully man. He was taking a decisive, irreversible step in committing to the cross. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me but not my will, your will be done. Jesus, yes, knew the will of God on earth. Jesus knew that as he told the demons, don't tell anybody who I am or don't tell anyone about me until his ministry, until his time. He knew when he told that man, son, your sins are forgiven. Get your pallet, rise up, get out of here. That guy runs up the greatest day of that guy's life when he ran out of that room and we never hear from that guy again, 
There's no gospel message. There might maybe some extra biblical, some hearsay or old wives tale about him and his wife or whatever happened, but there's no gospel message about or, or a narrative about this man again. He runs out and Jesus stands there with the bill. I want you to think with me. Just think, 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 okay? He's fully God. He's fully man. But right here, the cross, Jesus knows as he came to earth, the will of God for his life was to totally identify with. He was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God in the beginning. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, second person of the triune nature. Remember, we talked about the dance. Jesus, the Son of Man, knew the will of God was for him to face the cross. Right here, Jesus is making a profound statement when he says, your sons are forgiven. It, he was taking the first step towards becoming the will of God as the Son of Man. And this is just profound to me, and I hope you can see this. In other words, he, Jesus was inviting the skeptics to consider the hard evidence of the man's healing as evidence of Jesus' authority to forgive sins, which simply means this. When Jesus forgives this man's sins and heals his body, he puts a, his first down payment on my forgiveness also. It's a down payment on becoming the will of God. He knew the will of God on the cross. He became the will of God on earth. Which brings us back to the statement, which is easier to say. Again, the implication is, and I'm going to close with these final thoughts. The implication is, well, it's easy to say anything. But when that man ran out, Jesus was left with a bill. <laughs> Think of it that way. Jesus, likely, as he saw the man run out, had such joy and love in his heart. But he also knew that man, when he left, his ability to be forgiven, his ability to rise up and run out of that meeting that day was because he was going to pay the bill. It brings me back to that statement, which is easier. At this point, as God, it was easy to do both, forgive his sins and heal his body, because he was the Son of God. But as the cross comes into the picture of Jesus as the Son of Man, he knows there will be nothing easy about the price he will endure on the cross. I also just profoundly was, seriously, I, in, in my prayer chair when I thought about this, it really brought me to, to tears, just a tearful time of just reflecting and thinking through this process. All of the joy that I have in my salvation, all of the joy in ministry and having been married 45 and a half years and my children, all the joy I have in life, my parents, the rich heritage, all the joy in knowing that when my dad left this earth, my, my best friend, he was absent from the body and present with the Lord. All of that joy was because Jesus paid the bill. In other words, Jesus knows he can't defer that man's healing through an insurance company. Jesus knows he can't defer, God knew. Sinful man could never stand before a righteous and holy God. So the only way that, in other words, look at the picture, go back to the car. If I wanted to go to God the Father and say, God, Father, fix the car, right? I've wrecked your car on earth, fix it. The only way God could do that was through Jesus because I could not stand before a holy, righteous God as a sinful man. So Jesus comes and says, George, son, your sins are forgiven. I'll pay the bill. It's on me. Where does this take me? It takes me to a place of joy today. Look, I can only tell you this. Don't ever stop with the basics. Take a time in your house, in your home. Sit down. Just praise Him. Thank Him for salvation. 
Thank him for paying the bill. Thank him for fixing your car totally. Religion always defers it through an insurance company, through a man, through a middleman, or through a church that says, well, if you come to us and only if you do this through our church will you be saved. And all of this stuff. <laughs> and Jesus says, son, your sins are against me, man. And you know what? I got the tab. Pick up your pallet. Get on out of here and enjoy life. Look, he did it for him. He did it for me. He did it for many of you listening today. And he will do it for the rest of you listening today. If you haven't come to Jesus as Lord and Savior. I would just encourage you. I'm going to close with a final prayer. He did it for all of us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, John 3, 16. You know it. That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. In other words, God didn't send the Son into the world to defer the bill to the insurance company. He was the insurance of God. He came to pay the bill. He came to save us from the curse of the law, according to Galatians 3, and to bring a true relationship with God to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Final prayer. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just hope that people out there will understand and be humble with this, that how can he forgive sins? How can anyone forgive sins but God alone? They can't. And it wasn't easy. The price God paid was everything. But he accepts the bill, accepts the tab for our sins. Lord, we ask God for a lot of things. We make a lot of demands. But I pray this morning that the simple, profound dynamic of salvation would permeate all of our hearts. For those listening out there that don't know Jesus, I pray with you right now that if you just accept God into your heart, we just accept you into our heart, Jesus. We ask forgiveness of our sins and we receive forgiveness of our sins. Be our Lord, be our Savior. And in an essence, we say this, Father, fix my car, because only God can do that. And when we do that, the Bible tells us that our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the promise is to be absent from this earth is to be present with the Lord. We receive that promise this morning in Jesus' name. And we said amen and amen and amen. Again, God bless you. Remember, we are recording, live streaming, and or pre-recorded messages. We will have church here, outdoors, social distancing, all within the COVID rules uh, every Sunday that it's nice out. If not, you'll get this message uh, via recording. And we pray for the day we'll be gathered back together again as the saints. But until then, keep growing, keep loving, and uh, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.